Young Turks, I know, Jagger, I gotta be awesome. All right, uh, of course, we've got a lot of great topics for you, so just calm down, okay? We're gonna get to all of them. But first, <laughs> I didn't like that for a tease. Uh, we start with the role of money in politics. Did you know, guys, know that that's a big deal? Uh, it turns out a lot of people in Washington are taken aback by that. They were quite surprised that uh, Republicans and Democrats might actually be acting based on the money that they're getting. Weird, I know. All right, well, we have a ton of examples of that for you today. Uh, let me start with my favorite. So the U.S. Uh, Chamber of Commerce is led by a guy named uh, Tom Donahue. He's been very tough on President Obama. Uh, he gave a speech recently in Atlanta where he continued to be, and of course the president is not friendly enough to business. They would like to have uh, you know, less regulation in banking, in the oil industry. They'd like to be able to pollute more. They'd like lower taxes, all these lovely things, right? Uh, but to give you a sense of how the Obama administration is catering to them, uh, Tom Donahue says, you know what, lately he's been getting better. You know, Jeff Immelt, the CEO of GE, is now his top uh, outside economic advisor and that he is having a very positive influence on Obama, which scared the bejesus out of me. <laughs> I'm thinking, oh boy, if the Chamber of Commerce, which is massively right-wing and has no interest in the American people, what it has an interest in is, to be fair, protecting their own members, which, that's right, that makes sense, right? That's what they're in the, literally in the business of, right? Uh, and so they want to protect the banks and the oil companies, etc., right? That's their association. Uh, so if President Obama's making them happy, uh, it's probably not a great thing, okay? And it's not just that they're representing big businesses and small businesses and they're looking to hire people, etc. No, okay? Uh, they represent big business. In fact, a lot of small businesses are complaining about the Chamber of Commerce. And it's not just that they represent big business. They have taken that to mean that they should represent the right-wing position on all that. Because to be fair, again, to them, the right-wing position is the pro-corporate position, which is lower taxes for corporations, higher taxes on you, by the way, because, for example, one of the things that Tom Donahue pushed for in that speech in Atlanta was, hey, you know what, we don't mind higher taxes, let's do more higher gas taxes so we can pay for roads and bridges, etc. Now, that sounds interesting, right? Why is he saying that? Because the gas tax comes out of your pocket. you got to pay extra every time you pump gas. But what does it go to? It goes to roads. And who use the roads for their businesses? Well, business, big business. In order to get the products from China, where they're usually made, to Walmart, you got to put them on the trains, you got to put them on the roads, you got to go over bridges, etc. So they want you to get taxed to pay for their benefit. So they're not against taxes, they're just against taxes on rich people and on corporations. They're for taxes on you, right? So that's the Chamber of Commerce for you. Now, the Chamber of Commerce is pro-Republican, to say the least. Uh, they believe, as I said, in lower taxes. Uh, they believe in less regulation, etc. And so when Tom Donahue there had uh, went uh, and spoke in Atlanta, he also said something very curious, uh, which was to upbraid the Republican Party, especially the Tea Party members. He said, you know what, uh, they better get in line, basically, right, and raise that debt ceiling. Because the Chamber of Commerce represents those banks, and those banks think, no, 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 we got no interest in you fooling around with the debt ceiling because that might raise interest rates, which could cause a lot of problems for them for a great number of different reasons. And they don't want that. They don't want to lose a nickel over this. And look, they bought the Republican Party, so they, they want what they paid for. And look at what Tom Donahue says, because this is great. He says uh, that they better, that these uh, new Republican freshmen better do what they're told or, quote, we will get rid of you. We will get rid of you. I, nothing has been said in politics that is truer than that. That's it. He nailed it. That's uh, Republican politics and actually overall politics 100%. If you don't do as corporate America, or in reality multinational corporations, tell you to do, they will get rid of you. That is not an idle threat. That is absolutely correct. And uh, when asked about John Boehner, he had this condescending comment. He's growing into his shorts. He's put on his big boy pants. In other words, fall in line, man. We tell you what to do, and if you're going to be a good big boy, okay, you follow orders. We're your boss. 
Now, John Boehner doesn't mind that because he's grown into his big boy pants. He knows how to take orders. He's great at taking orders from the uh, corporate world, right? So they're mostly covered. But Donahue's worried about the Tea uh, Party freshmen, which I think is to the great credit of the Tea Party freshmen. Now, a lot of people will take this story because then now the fight has begun. And they will say, oh, my God, you see that fun? There's an internal battle within the Republican Party. They're falling apart. Blah, blah, blah. I don't care about that, okay? What I care about is someone actually standing up to corporations. And shockingly enough, it's a guy who I think has said crazy things in the past. A uh, new uh, congressman from Illinois, Joe Walsh, stands up to Tom Donahue. He goes on Fox News and he takes him on. Let's listen. Congressman, what do you make of that? Neil, I found Tom Donahue's comments outrageous, uh, tone deaf, totally establishment, and doesn't understand at all uh, where we're at right now. And, you and don't I've think he was joking, you, Congressman? No, you know, not at all. If he was joking, Neil, he was joking as much as the president was joking yesterday when he said maybe these shovel-ready projects weren't really shovel ready I'm, yeah, I'm i'm tired of these little jokes hey if tom donahue is more comfortable having nancy pelosi as speaker next year because he wants to get rid of all of us tea party fiscally conservative freshmen who came here on a mission to save our kids from the debt we're placing on their backs then then fine he can have nancy pelosi as his speaker i found his comments outrageous now, do I agree with the Tea Party on their spending priorities? Of course not, right? Do I even agree with them on raising the debt ceiling? I do not, right? But I still find that to be incredibly positive. The reason I find it to be positive is he's saying, look, I got sent here by my voters. Now, whether I agree or disagree with their, his voters is irrelevant. If he actually represents his voters, I love it. That would be a great breakthrough in our democracy. And he says, uh, you, I want you on us to raise the debt ceiling because that's... Uh, helps your corporations that are in your chamber of commerce uh, and actually those corporations don't mind the overspending at all uh, they like to just t they take a lot of that spending for themselves that's they bribe the politicians to get a lot of that spending they get a, a lot of the subsidies that way etc cetera, etc cetera. now sometimes they mind it if, it if the debt gets out of hand and then they want to shift all the problems onto the middle class and the Tea Party will help them do that tremendously that's why they get along 98 percent of the time but in this one time Walsh is saying we're not taking our orders from you you might have created this beast and you might have funded all of us you might have put us in office but we get to do whatever we want and I think that's a great development and if he is actually earnest in his ideology I got no problems with him we can have those debates my problem is with politicians who are not earnest and who just take that money to get reelected and don't give a damn about their voters. So, a rare positive development in politics, and it comes from the Republican side. Even on issues I do not agree with at all. All right, good news. But, by the way, <laughs> can we keep it real for a second? Let's get real. Believe me, they'll fall in line. Okay, maybe Walsh doesn't fall in line. And remember, I told you, Walsh is a wild card. That guy's one term and done. I predicted that before. Because he said some crazy stuff in the past. But you know what? All that crazy stuff is nothing compared to telling the Chamber of Commerce you're not interested in them. Because then all of a sudden they won't be interested in sending you a check. I'm telling you that Joe Walsh has a limited life shelf in Washington. But look, if the Tea Party actually stands up to the Chamber of Commerce, that's fantastic. But my guess is that in the, in the end, they will not. They will fall in line. They will get their big boy pants on. <laughs> okay? Uh, all right, let's see how it turns out. All right, now, on a new Gingrich, uh, he is having trouble again. This is about the millionth time in a row that he's gotten in trouble already in his very short presidential run so far. Uh, well, uh, ABC News has looked into his charities, and remember, he's got a lot of different organizations that he's set up. He's got some for-profit groups, but he's also got some non-profit charities. And then he has his uh, movies and his uh, books that he sells and he gives speeches so he's doing all this stuff at the same time and now he's running for president so it all gets a little complicated and you gotta make sure that you're following the laws so when he starts to run for president he disassociates himself from uh, a lot of these groups because he has to by law he seems to have done that okay but when you get into what he was doing before and what those uh, ch so-called charities were doing that's where we have the trouble so uh, he had this charity called renewing American leadership now, this is mainly uh, to talk about religion in public life and how it has an important role. 
And it actually got a lot of small donors, raised a lot of money, a couple of million dollars, okay? Turns out they took $220,000 of that and sent it to one of Gingrich's for-profit entities. Now, that is incredibly convenient. So what what were some of the things that they bought with that money? Well, first of all, they paid uh, for Gingrich's spokesperson. Well, wait a minute. He's Gingrich's spokesperson for his for-profit ventures as well, for his political stuff. Uh, In fact, he was his spokesperson uh, during the campaign until he just quit, until they all quit on Gingrich, partly because of these shenanigans. Uh, So should the charity be paying for that? Mm, Probably not. But it gets better. You know what else they paid for? They paid for a whole heap of Newt Gingrich books and DVDs. Oh, isn't that convenient? He's like, what, 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 what? My nonprofit charity was very interested in my for-profit books and DVDs, so I just happened to transfer the money over there, and, you know, all those good people who cared about religion in America, they cared about it by buying my books and DVDs. <laughs> so, this is a funny coincidence, and I got rich off of it. Huh, what a thunk. When ABC News caught up with him and asked him about this, he said, why don't you ask me about the speech I'm about to give, not this stuff. Why? He don't want to talk about that, because it's shady, right? And look, this isn't just that one uh, charity. Newt's been doing this and intermingling all this for a long time. First of all, in that charity, it's not just the money he's taken for the books and the DVDs and to fund his staff for all the other projects. He uh, also, on their website for the charity, has all these pictures of Newt and Newt's brilliant ideas, Newt's defense of Paul Ryan's Medicare plan? Wait, wait a minute, that's totally part of his campaign. What's that doing on the nonprofit charity website? When they asked the charity that, the guy who's running it now is a pastor from San Diego because Newt had to hand it off, right? He says, oh yeah, yeah uh, that's not a bad point. And boom, he takes it off, <laughs> okay? Because <laughs> they were doing something wrong. When they asked him about the books, because Newt says, oh, or, and his handlers say, oh, the books were, we didn't make any money off those, we gave it at cost. When they asked the pastor who's running the charity, he's like, yeah, that was one of my concerns. It seemed like we were paying a lot for those books. He's like, I even have books, and when our church buys it, I, I, I either break even or lose money on it. I don't know why we were paying so much for those books. Pastor, I know why you were paying so much for those books. <laughs> what did you think this was all for? Now, uh, the other thing he does is he raises money uh, to give speeches on things that people care about, right? Uh, so-called people care. But some of them are for the for-profit entities. So, for example, he's got one on health care, right? Now, that one I don't mind as much. It's still unethical, but I don't mind it as much because uh, a lot of fat cats uh, fund that. So they, rich people send him money to go give speeches on health care. And so what does Newt do? He takes a private jet. And he takes best hotels in the world, and he spends all that money, and he spends the money from that group that's funding you know, his ideas, right, and also his incredible travel. So, uh, but the pro- a problem I have is when he takes small donors. Look, it's all unethical. You shouldn't do that, you know. If you should pay your own way. Uh, or if you're going to make money off a of speech, which he often does, then you should definitely pay for your airline ticket, your hotel, etc. But look, when he takes small money, like as he did with the uh, religious non-profit, uh, and, and most of it came in small donors, those people, look, they're earnest. And again, I might not agree with their politics, but they really believed that Newt was going to stand up for their cause, that, that he was going to do the right thing, and that he was going to promote religion in, in America. And instead, they take their money and they funnel it to Newt's back pocket by buying his books and his DVDs and funding his staff and basically promoting and marketing his political campaign. Come on, man. That, there's something a little, at least a little sick about that. And, you know, this isn't the only time that they've run a scam like this, not Newt Gingrich, although Newt Gingrich it got fined $300,000 back in the day when he was Speaker of the House for running a similar shell game with a nonprofit charity that was actually promoting his politics, right? So he's done this trick before. But you remember Sarah Palin. Her nonprofit bought $63,000 worth of Sarah Palin books. Look, they're doing this to rip you off. I, look, maybe I shouldn't help out the conservative voters, but I'm telling you, they don't have your best interests in mind. They have their best interests in mind, and they're just sucking that money out of your pocket, and it probably hurt you to donate, you know? It, I, those guys, a lot of those donors are not rich, and they had to make a decision, hey, do I eat out this week, or do I give to Newt Gingrich's important cause about religion, or Sarah Palin, you know, and the Mama Grizzlies, etc., and come to find out they just pocketed it. Don't be a sucker, man. Look, there's a lot of people who do, you know, who fight for conservative causes without ripping you off. 
I don't know who they are, but I'm sure they exist. But we do know who does rip you off, Newt Gingrich and Sarah Palin. All right, so that's Newt. By the way, there's a whole other theory that I don't have time to get into about the real reason that Newt's in trouble is the third wife. She likes to travel. She likes the high life. Okay. Did one of you guys come up with that originally? Or it might have been one of the MSNBC guys. But somebody came up with that, and then next thing you know, I saw two different articles on Callista Gingrich, you know, had some disagreements with the staff. You know, he took the two-week vacation to the Greek Isles. The staff was like, are you crazy? You're running for president. She's like, we're going on that vacation. I don't care what you think you're running for. <laughs> Tough to keep that mistress happy. Now new wife, of course. Uh, she's the one that ran up to $500,000 at Tiffany's. All right, I've said enough. We move on. <laughs> okay, now speaking of money, turns out uh, some of the top conservative think tanks are funneling a lot of that money uh, to uh, the top right-wing talk show hosts. So, Heritage Foundation, probably the largest conservative think tank, has given $2 million to Rush Limbaugh and $1.3 million to Sean Hannity. Now, they give it to their program, and then they get ads and promotion, uh, et cetera, uh, it, for that deal. Now, I'm a little split on this. By the way, there's a lot of think tanks doing it now. Uh, Freedom Works, uh, uh, Americans for Prosperity, two so-called Tea Party groups also giving to Glenn Beck. F Freedom Works is a big sponsor of Glenn Beck. Uh, and, uh, and Mark Levine is another uh, host that's getting some of this money. Now, the reason I'm split on it is, one is, it's, it's logical, right? Now, if you're looking to get new conservatives, um, you know, go into Rush Limbaugh's program or Glenn Beck's program, it's a sensible place to go to, you know, raise up your email list or to your donors or whatever. And some of these groups say, hey, we made more money, and, and that's why the ads make sense, because people signed up, and we made a lot of money off the sign-ups, off the programs. So I'm not hating on it, you know. The problem, though, that this presents is that are they really representing their true opinions, you know, Rush Limbaugh, et cetera, or are they getting paid a lot of money to just present the opinions of these think tanks? Now, it's tough to tell because they're so like-minded, and so, again, that I, I'm being fair there, saying I get why that happens. On the other hand, let's say they disagreed, and you got $2 million coming in, and it's, they're not paying you for your disagreement. They're paying you for your agreement, right? And Rush Limbaugh has defended, for example, the Heritage Foundation on air, not as part of an ad, but as like, oh, no, no, the Heritage Foundation, they're definitely, because these people have internal conflicts from time to time. And what the smaller conservative think tanks or charities are concerned about is that the big guys are pushing them out and overpowering them by using, by buying the conservative talk show hosts. Is that happening to some degree? Oh, of course it is. There's no question about that. But, and, and look, again, to be fair, like Beck says, hey, you know what, I, I, I advertise Freedom Works, and he says sometimes when he's talking positively in the middle of the show about Freedom Works, he says, look, I'll be doing an ad for them a little later. Okay, so that's good. That's, he should do that, right? Now, having said all this, the main problem is the guys who fund the think tanks. The guys who fund them are, you know, obviously some of the richest people in the country, uh, some of the corporations that are going to benefit from some of the laws that are passed, uh, and, of course, Coke Industries has funded all three of those groups, right? Now, there are other funders as well, but Coke Industries is a huge funder for all three of those groups. So Coke Industries wants uh, less EPA regulation because they're, they're some, one of the top polluters in the country. Uh, and they, some of their products have carcinogens, and they want to make sure that that does not get regulated, that that get, gets into our products that, that we either consume or use, right? So lo and behold, Glenn Beck, Sean Hannity, et cetera, the rest of them are like, oh, the EPA, nonsense, okay? Oh, the regulations, oh, we're over-regulated. I can't believe how over-regulated we are. How did I do, David Koch? Did I do all right? Charles Koch, everybody happy? Okay. Uh, and, of course, they're against cap and trade, and you can go down the list. Uh, you know, banks give money to think tanks, and all of a sudden, the uh, think tanks turn around and give millions of dollars to Rush Limbaugh. All of a sudden, Rush Limbaugh is totally in favor of deregulating the banks. Look, he probably would have been there anyway. He probably would have had that opinion anyway because he gets paid for that opinion all along anyway, right? Look at his advertisers, et cetera, right? Is it a co coincidence that Glenn Beck thinks that the greatest thing you should buy right now because of the calamities that are about to fall upon us is gold and his main sponsor is Goldline? Look, so I know how it works. I understand. But I'm letting you know so you know where all this is coming from. So the Rush Limbaugh's and all those guys are never going to disagree with the Koch brothers because that's where their bread gets buttered. 
So all those top uh, guys who want, if the main thing they want is lower tax cuts, right? I mean, more tax cuts, lower tax rates, right? And so you will never hear any of those talk show hosts saying, hey, you know what? Maybe we should have a reasonable rate tax structure. They weren't saying it before. They certainly ain't going to say it now. So again, mixed feelings. Some of the ideas are, you know, are similar anyway, and it makes sense that those groups would want to get membership from the, that audience. But at the same time, it, I'm sure it greatly influences the opinion of those hosts, and they should be try to be as upfront about it as possible. Uh, and and again, I give Beck credit for, on occasions, pointing that out, which is the right thing to do. So, there you have it. JR, have I been too soft on that? Uh, you know what, because I, I, originally I would immediately say so yeah, because it's the fact that if you don't mask it, if, if, I mean if you mask it the way that they are, most of the rest of them are doing it, except for Glenn Beck, then I see a problem with it. Because then it's actually changing people's minds and putting people in a certain place. Although it's not the same as a news outlet, covering up the fact that they're leading stories for whoever's paying their bills. We know these guys are scams, but the people who are listening and believe them don't know that. Yeah. So it's 50-50. You, it is 50-50. Are you supposed to protect the idiots? Well, see, here, here's the thing, right? Like, so let me tell you my standard real quick. So when we do ads, and even if it's within the show, which almost never happens, but we actually wouldn't mind that. It's called product placement. And we, but well, if we do, we would just tell you, right? There's no question about it. We would never do it on the stealth, right? Uh, but there's a different layer. Like, so let's say, you know, like our new sponsor we have is T-Mobile, right? And you see the ads sometimes if you're watching YouTube, et cetera, for T-Mobile, or whatever it might be, Netflix, et cetera, right? Everybody gets it. You're doing an ad, you get money, that's how you run the show. Uh, we have membership too, that helps, of course, and that helps us be more independent. Um, but it's different when it's on policy issues. So, for example, if T-Mobile said, all right, now we want you to be in favor of warrantless wiretapping. <laughs> I got a couple of words for them. That's not how it's going to work. Okay, so we would never do that. And then, second of all, on things that are driven almost purely by issues, now it could be conservative think tanks or it could be unions, for example. If we take union money and then we don't tell you we're taking union money and, and we just tell you, oh, unions rock, that's a huge problem. We don't do that. And, you know, does that mean we should never take union money? Probably not. I, but I would, I, and, you know, there's all those theories, oh, you're Soros finest. Where? Where the hell is Soros? Ah, oh, unions pay for it. Unions don't pay for a damn thing, okay? But, you know, if they wanted to run ads, we'd probably take their ads, but we'd be incredibly careful and tell you, and I'll tell you what, if I disagreed with them, I'd say it in a flat second, and if they want to drop us as a sponsor, have at it, Hoss, because we're not going to ruin the whole point of the show by doing that. Now, are the conservative guys as ethical? Okay, you be the judge. We report, you decide. All right, listen, uh, we're going to take a quick break here. We've got more money news. We have more wiener news. <laughs> but it's fun. All right, come right back. All right, back on the Young Turks, Jen and Anna with you. Uh, we will be doing Rick Santorum on, on the gays. Okay, that's coming up in one second. But I've decided I'm also throwing another extra random story in. Ooh, I like that. Okay, now that's, I've been doing this all week. Now, this is a very post gamey story, mm -hmm. but nonetheless, let's have fun. Uh, so, you know that the Uyghur family is a friend of the squirrels. We're a friend of Squirrel Nation. Uh, I didn't know that, but I'm glad yeah. I know now. Uh, you guys remember when uh, one time it was a story of when I was uh, jogging and, uh, and, and I saw a squirrel and he was about to run away, and I told him, calm down. Okay, 10 2, 10 2. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and he calmed down and he did not run away. Okay? And I didn't know that squirrels spoke English. Yeah, no, well, it turns out they do. And, <laughs> and so then uh, one of our listeners named me uh, one who talks with squirrels. Okay, mm -hmm. makes sense. Now, there's a very important follow-up to that. Uh, Wendy, my wife, mm -hmm. the other day, is uh, in the little parking lot area, uh, you know, where we live, and she sees a squirrel. But the squirrel has like one of those plastic Easter eggs, like green Easter egg things, stuck on its head. Oh, 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 right, right. And, uh, and so she, uh, she tries to help him, mm -hmm. right? And she goes, come here, squirrel, come here, right? And the squirrel's a little scared, and she's a little scared, but she finally, you know, comes close to the squirrel, and then, like, once they get in contact, she flips out a little bit, he flips out a little bit, they retreat, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. And then she talks to him, okay? Apparently this is a thing that Uyghurs can do, right? So she's like, come here, 
come here, come here. And the squirrel comes. Uh -huh. Okay? She took the thing off his head. Saved his life. Wendy, squirrel saved saver. His, squirrel saver. A friend of Squirrel Nation. Queen of the squirrels. You okay. know, it's funny. Uh, in Texas, police officers shoot at squirrels. Yeah. Right. No. Do you remember that story? I do. But here in uh, Rebel Headquarters, okay, uh, the Mecca of Libs, okay, we save squirrels. We don't shoot them, okay? <laughs> uh, and she was, you know, I th I'm very proud of her for doing that. Because actually it's kind of ballsy to go up to a squirrel. A squirrel could have health issues, etc., right? It could have rabies, right? Yeah. And I, I'm sh what I'm most shocked at is that the squirrel actually came to her, right? And I think now I've seen around the parking lot, there's a lot of squirrels there. The uh, squirrels are like, oh, those are the good guys. Like, Jake, the longer you talk about this, the more I'm concerned about your mental health, okay? <laughs> Could you imagine the squirrels are like, those are the good guys. Live headquarters. All right, anyway, so fun little story for you guys. That's now, good, man. I've got a pet possum in my place. Oh, Ew, yeah. I saw a picture on Facebook yeah, of your pet possum. That's from the stairs at, at, to my, right to my, fr to my front door. Th th that's not Chilling. fun. It was only like this big. He was, a, he was an adolescent. Uh -huh. Is there an animal more ugly than a possum? Well, that's the thing about animals, right? So a possum, of course, you got to go after, right? you got to get gee, gee, and rough talk him and run him off or kill him or something because he's ugly. We took pictures. Oh, you did? Okay, good. We named nice. it. Lib headquarters. That's what we are, Lib headquarters. We don't Definitely. even kill ugly animals. I actually like the name okay. of the possum. It was very clever. Are you going to share with the audience? Do you remember? Pablo P. Possum. So it's Pablo P. Possum. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. Come on. Give me a break. No, that's great. That's great. All right. We have a friend of Animal Nation. Okay. We, we help them all. We help the ugly ones. We help the cute, cute ones. By the way, one real quick thing. Yesterday, I brought my dog into the studio. I didn't want to leave her home alone. My parents are out of town. And um, JR was very affectionate with her. He kept asking to take pictures with her. I swear to God. Okay. I was trying to leave after a long day of work. He's like, wait, wait, just please take a couple you know of pictures. Why? What? That dog is so petrified of me. It's, it's hilarious, actually. It's funny. It doesn't make any sense. Now, not buying it. Here's what's actually happening. Jared Jackson talks a big game. Oh, yeah, I'm in favor of dog killers like Michael Vick. Yeah, kill all the dogs. And then he sees a little cutie dog. Like, oh. <laughs> Reminds me of Pablo Picasso. Oh. <laughs> okay. He's a big softy inside. He really is. Everybody in here is a bunch of libs. All right, let's get started. Speaking of libs, let's talk about the gays. So Rick Santorum is talking to Don Lemon of CNN. Uh, Don Lemon recently came out. So and Rick Santorum, of course, famous uh, for comments like, "If we allow uh, gays to get married, eventually we'll have men on dog sex." <laughs> okay. Uh, so Don Lemon is going to ask him about that. Very logical. Let's see how it turns out. I was recently on Joy Behar, and she said that she called you. I think it was bigoted. I'm paraphrasing. Bigoted or homophobic or what have you. I have what a difference of agreement on a public policy issue. That doesn't mean I'm, 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 you know, I hate anybody. I don't hate anybody. I, my, my, I'm called by my faith and I'm uh, to, to love everybody. I do. I mean, I, I, I pray for people whether they're for me or against me because that's what I'm supposed to do. And just because I disagree with a, uh, you know, what a definition, a, a legal definition of what marriage is, doesn't mean I dislike anybody or hate anybody or, or in spiteful of anybody. It's because I think that's what's best for society and. We should be able to disagree without calling people bigots. Yeah. Uh, I think that's really sad that 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 you have people on the other side because you you stand up for something that has been an institution in this in this world for two thousand years that all of a sudden now you're a you're a hater you're a mean person. I'm not. Uh, I've, I've never been. Do you and, uh, do you have any gay friends? Yeah. In fact, I've had I've had gay people work for me. Yeah. And friends. Yes. You know, people say I have black friends. I, I well, I, I mean, yes, I have, in fact, I was with a gay friend of mine just two days ago. And you should have seen the things we were doing. All right, anyway. Um, first, uh, so I don't hate anybody, right? This is, look, this is what uh, people used to say when they didn't want uh, blacks and whites getting married, right? They said, oh, I don't hate anybody. I just don't want them marrying our women. So, <laughs> what? And now all of a sudden I'm a big. All of a sudden, I hate, I'm not mean. I'm very nice to my white friends. I just don't want the black folks getting married to the white folks. That's all, right? It's just a difference of opinion. Why you got to call people names? You know, I agree with Santorum. Mm -hmm. When oh, yeah. are we going to experience a day in America when we can compare homosexuality to bestiality and not be called a bigot? Yeah. It's right. just unfair. Look, he's just got a disagreement, you know? He thinks that gay people should not be allowed to be married because their love is not real and they're, 
you know, made all the wrong choices in the world, but he doesn't hate them. He just thinks they're inferior or different or weird or unnatural and that God is not in favor of them. In fact, he has gay friends. But what now are you going to call him names because, you know, he just has a disagreement with you, right? He's very nice to his gay friends and underlings. He says gay people work underneath him. Ah, Jay. <laughs> <laughs> hey, am I still not supposed to say that? That's okay. when you're supposed to use the drum thing. Uh, okay, all right. Well, I can use a lot of different things. Uh, but I was going to go with... Oh, give me a break. <laughs> all right. Uh, what's next? All right. In December, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives decided to conduct a sting operation to find what uh, they refer to as uh, these uh, straw dealers. Like, okay. th th basically individuals who buy guns uh, legally in the United States, but then they smuggle the guns to drug cartels in Mexico. Right? Oh, that would never happen. I'm told by the NRA that all the people who buy guns are totally legitimate uh, Americans with Second Amendment rights. You tell me they're falling into drug dealers? Guns? Well, that's really weird. I mean, we already know that our dr um, drug, our gun policies are so relaxed that purchasing guns is so easy. I mean, I, I've heard stories, no, I've read stories, actual reports of members of the drug cartels crossing the border and purchasing guns themselves because they can do so without background checks. You can do it at gun shows. You can do it in several different ways. But now um, there's a middleman. There are people in the United States who purchase the guns and they smuggle it to Mexico for the cartels, right? So what does the government want to do? They want to find these people and, okay, and they want to, they want to, um, you know, do this sting operation. And they launched this sting operation back in December. Now they were able to find the middlemen, okay, the people who were smuggling the guns to Mexico. Except after finding those people, they allowed the guns to still remain in Mexico, and there were at least 2,000 weapons in Mexico that were smuggled there that this, uh, you know, that this bureau knew about, and they did absolutely nothing about it. They just let the guns remain there. They let the drug cartels use those guns. And in fact, there were at least 150 shootings in both Mexico and the United States uh, that were uh, done by these, that were uh, not done by, but these guns were used in 150 of these shootings. Yeah, uh, it was a big oopsie doopsie. Oops, we lost track of those 2,000 guns. Oh well. Oops, they were used in shootings. Oh well. Uh, so yeah, I would, I would characterize that as a fairly large mistake. Uh, by the way, uh, Tim Pawlenty, when asked, by the way, now I'm also oh, nervous about how to pronounce Pawlenty's name, because mm -hmm. Dave gets on me after every show. It's not Pawlenty, it's Pawlenty. Uh, the Pawlenty, okay, anyway. Uh, so. Tim Pawlenty asked about the loophole where terrorists can buy guns. Mm -hmm. You know, because he's Mr. Republican, tough guy against terrorists, right? He's like, oh, no, no, Second Amendment, right? Of course terrorists sh should be allowed to buy guns. They're so inconsistent with everything. I know. They, Muslims need to take fun. loyalty tests. We can't really trust them. Oh, they want to buy, not just Muslims, obviously. Terrorists want to buy guns? Oh, of course you should let them do that. Well, if you're on the terrorist watch list, you're still protected, you know. Yeah, of course Amendment. you've got rights. If you're Muslim, you're not protected. Mm -hmm. But if you're on the terrorist watch list, you're protected. By the if, way, what if gay people can buy guns? Oh, good question. Good question. I shotgun think they weddings, maybe. <laughs> Definitely. As long not as they good. don't use them in shotgun weddings, then gays can buy guns. Uh, I think, in fact, I think I read somewhere some NRA guy was like, "Whoa, whoa, we're pro-gay. We we want them to have guns to protect themselves." So, at least they're consistent on that. They want everybody to have guns. <laughs> All right. Next. Okay, this is an interesting case. Okay, so a federal appeals court in Pennsylvania has ruled that uh, two different school districts in Pennsylvania uh, breached the rights of students, of two different students, for punishing them for what they did after school hours on their own personal computers. So both of these students um, had an issue with their principal, so they created these fake MySpace accounts where they use the principal's picture, and these are two separate students, two separate principals. They use the principal's pictures on the MySpace accounts, and then they uh, wrote terrible things. Like, for instance, one of the students, who was a middle school uh, student at the time, created the uh, MySpace page and said that, you know, hi, I'm principal, blah, blah, blah. 
uh, I'm a pedophile and I like to touch little boys. Yeah, that's, that's unfortunate. Okay, another student uh, created a MySpace page that said, oh, I'm addicted to alcohol uh, and, and drugs and I have beer at my desk at all times. That's a little funnier. That's a little funny. Yeah, okay. okay. But, but it's interesting because um, people are debating as to whether or not the schools should have the ability to punish these students. And originally, the schools did punish the students. Both students got a 10-day suspension. And um, this went all the way to court. And ultimately, what a federal appeals court in Pennsylvania decided was, no, the school should not be allowed to punish them for what they did after school off campus. Hmm. If, That's interesting. If they want to press criminal charges against the kids, if, if, they want to, if the principal himself wants to do something like that, of course he's able to do that, but he should do that without the school getting involved. And ultimately, I think I agree. Yeah, I think I disagree. Uh, I, it's close. You know, Look, I want to ki protect the kids' rights as much as possible, and if they did it about somebody else, that ain't got nothing to do with the school, okay? But the principal or the teachers, that is part of the school, I mean, like in the old days, if you you know people would write would do like stupid, dirty cartoons about the teachers, and you know, of course, they bring them to school. Then they're in the school. That's different, right? Mm -hmm. But even if they pass them around the neighborhood, and, and somebody brought it into school, and remember, the internet is everywhere, mm -hmm. so you could also access it in the school, right? Right. Then then you would get suspended for that, and I think rightfully so, right? Especially the thing with the pedophile. That's pretty nasty. And, and and I'm glad you mentioned that because I think that these two cases should be treated differently because the one MySpace page that indicated that the uh, principal was a, a pedophile, right? That's not only damaging to his reputation, but the only way that the school can punish the students is if their activity uh, disrupts the, the classroom, if it substantially disrupts the work and discipline in the school. And I think with that case, it de definitely does, because now all of a sudden the, the students are talking to one another, oh my God, is the principal a pedophile? Is he going to molest me? Is he going to do this and that? And I think that that's definitely damaging yeah, you know, to what's happening in the classroom. Justice Kasparian, you're beginning to swing me on that, because look, if the kid's writing on his computer at home or he's texting or he's on putting on Facebook or something, I don't like the principal. Mm -hmm. I think he's got funny hair. I don't want him getting punished for that, right? So there is a line somewhere, right? right. And so some actions, I think, would be beneath the line and some would be over the line. I think the pedophile thing is over the line. And I, I would have given leeway to the school to, to punish them on that. Um, so, you know, so I, I guess I disagree overall with the ruling. And uh, these cases, of course, must have happened back in 2007, right? Yes, these cases happened in 07. They oh, they really, did? They I really nailed did. it. How you did know, you know? Because MySpace. Who the hell is on MySpace? I know, I know. That's, that's <laughs> right? a good point. That gave it right away. <laughs> 07 though I nailed the year man damn I'm good All both, right. both of those cases are damaging though I mean you also don't want I mean, although maybe it's a lesser thing because it's not criminal to have alcohol but you have it in your desk that's a fireball offense all this stuff I mean if anybody's look it's disparaging their career and who they are mm -hmm. so I mean if a I mean if it's maybe there's a horrible analogy but if a teacher is hooking up with a student which happens all the time now mm -hmm. what if it happens away from campus still wrong I and mean, it's it's, the teacher's still going to get fired for it. You can't, just because they're not screwing the kid in the classroom, doesn't mean that they shouldn't be doing it away from campus either. These are all breaking the rules. I mean, if it gets that volatile, of course, we went to the base thing of like, oh, I don't like the guy's hair. He's mm -hmm. balding. <laughs> you know, big deal. You know, we can get yeah. beyond that. But uh, he was saying no. Live sex in a classroom. By the way, I just read an article about a teacher in Palmdale, a 35 year old teacher in Palmdale, female teacher who uh, had sex with a 13-year-old male student in the classroom, like, during recess. What are you, what are you doing? What are you doing? Really? You're 35 years old? She, he's 13. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I, you look, we've covered those stories to death, and I'm yeah. amazed by it every single time. There's something wrong with it. You know, you know what it is with the women? They're just they're obsessed with the attention. They need the attention so bad, and that's why they're going in that direction. That's they're really so sad. Yeah, it is. And there's something a little off with them, obviously, right? All right. So, uh, once again, for clarity, uh, you, if you say the principal's got bad breath, you, you can go ahead and put that on Facebook or Friendster or whatever you're on these days. Uh, but uh, if you say things that are going to hurt his career, et cetera, can't happen. Okay? Right. And you've got to understand what the courts, why the court made that ruling. It's because they want to protect, uh, you know, the freedom of speech. They want to protect right. students uh, from, 
being disciplined over saying how they feel online right. about their teachers. Right. Makes sense. Yeah. All right. Okay, we should take a quick break. Let's take a All quick right. break, and then I'm going to talk about suicide kids. It's going to be a great, fun story. Oh, yeah, fantastic. Suicide. And no squirrels when we come back.